Her name is Thais Gibson. Thais Gibson. Thais Gibson. Thais Gibson. Thais Gibson. Thais Gibson. I hope I pronounce her name properly. Thais Gibson. I am so excited for you to be here with me today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Leaf. I'm so excited to have you here. Such a fan of your work. And for anybody who's new to learning a little bit about you, I would love if you can just start our listeners off by sharing a little bit about your background and how you got into this field to begin with. Absolutely. Well, it's lovely to see you again, Ty. We just, we, I just interviewed you recently and we did an amazing interview. You have so much wonderful, wonderful, wonderful information to share. So thank you as well. And it's great to be on your podcast. Well, I've been in the field a long time. I'm, it's almost, um, almost close to four decades now that I've been in this field of the whole mind brain body interaction and thinking and neuroscience and you know brain and and communication pathology and even audiology i've got you know a few qualifications under my belt i practiced for 25 years and i've been doing research though for nearly 40 still run a clinical team we still we just actually published one of our another paper came out just a week ago on how the mind changes the brain and the body and the whole network and how habits form and all that kind of thing. So what really got me going, Ty, in this field was I always wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And um, that was my goal. And you know, and I, then I debated being a teacher. And I thought, no, I'd rather be a neurosurgeon. And I got into medicine and realized that was not what I wanted to do. And I was very fortunate. We were at a, uni was at a university that was trying out a new degree, which was a combination of medicine, neuroscience, neurology, communication, pathology, audiology, psychology, like a whole combination. They literally took seven years of um, like two degrees that would have been done over seven years and put it into four. I don't know what they were trying to achieve because it was crazy because we went to lectures all day, six days a week, and we were in clinic literally seven days a week. It was four years of, as I was doing it, I remember thinking, I will tell everyone not to do this because it's absolute hell. So a thousand of us applied, 60 of us qualified, and then they changed the degree. And um, they split it in, in back into the the different the different degrees. Now I say that all to say the following is that during while, while I was doing it, I knew I was getting knowledge that was phenomenal. I was getting angles. I was seeing things from not just like a biomedical perspective or a medical perspective or a psychological perspective or, you know, communication. But I was getting the whole lot and seeing it from so many different angles as well as getting research experience and clinical experience. And I think that foundation really opened my eyes. And I am so pleased in retrospect that I did do that because when I continued with my MSc and my PhD and um, I had a clear direction of where I wanted to go in and I wouldn't have had that if I had not. So that that really put me in this path. And one lecture that really, this many, but there was one lecture that really stimulated the research into neuroplasticity, for example, which was a lecture, a neurology lecture was talking about neuroscience and neurology and how the brain couldn't change excuse me, back in the 80s when this lecture was happening and I was doing my initial training, um, they didn't believe that the brain could change. So that the, that the philosophy from about around about the 50s to the late 80s, it was believed that the mind was separate from the brain, which is correct, your mind, brain, body. But they believed that once the brain was damaged, that was it. And I remember listening to this and thinking, you know, they're giving us all these theories and, you know, and it made so much sense. And I thought, but it, that doesn't make sense. And I put up my hand and I asked the professor and I said, you know, it doesn't make sense because as humans, we're different. We grow, we change. We're always having different experiences. We learn new things. We we improve habits, we whatever. And so therefore, our mind is changing. Therefore, our brain must change. And he actually said to me quite sort of like almost facetiously, oh, well, go do the research. And I said, sure. You know, I was a young, innocent student. So I said, great, I'll do the research. And what do you suggest? And he said, go into the, you know, do research in traumatic brain injury because, and he, there he was kind of like, it was, it was a negative challenge because it was, well, why waste your time? Because once the brain's damaged, you can't fix it. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying it to almost be negative and I didn't I just took it up and thought okay that's what I'm going to do there was so little research on traumatic brain injury in the 80s and what was there was very negative it was just pretty much teach a person who's had brain damage how to compensate because there's no hope so it just cannot be like that as humans there's so much more hope and so began my journey that has continued and will continue when I saw that when you help a person understand the mind and how to direct their mind you can change the, or automatically the brain will change and I did some of the first neuroplasticity research back in the late 80s, early 90s in my field and 
I saw that, you know, your brain can change because your mind is changing. Now we know from the mid-90s with the advent of MRI and fMRI and that technology, well, MRI, that um, the brain does change all the time. And so the brain's always changing. Why? Because the mind's always changing. When you die, your brain disintegrates, but your mind keeps going on. However, whatever you philosophy you, or belief you subscribe to, but the mind is absorbing our life. It's running the mental and physical and brain aspects of who we are as humans. And so that has to be the it's sort of where we need to start our research and then see the impact on the mind and the brain we'll go in that direction. And that's how I landed up in the field of psycho neurobiology. So that's a long answer to your question, but it lays quite a big foundation. <laughs> I love that. And I love hearing the background and the story of the challenge and, and just your optimism and your hope. I think that's like such a, a beautiful part of your personality that there's this hope, like there has to be something more and you being able to actually take the initiative to discover that for yourself is really, really powerful and beautiful to see. So, so you have this amazing book called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. And in this book, you talk a lot about um, the neurocycle and you go into a little bit of, about the five steps and what this actually means. And, and do you mind just sharing a little bit about that for anybody who's really new to these concepts? Absolutely. So maybe, um, Ty, if I could begin by just explaining what, when we talk about mind, brain, body, now for the last few years, everyone so is more familiar with wellness and for integrative medicine and functional medicine and have a holistic approaches, but that wasn't really the case back in the 80s and early 90s. It was quite new, that concept of your mind can change your brain, as I explained, and the sort of holistic focus. And even in the last 40 years, as we've learned more about the brain, it's been funny, like two things have been happening. We've we've started seeing the integrated nature of the mind and body connection, but there's also been a lot of focus on just the brain because as we've learned more about the brain, it's been so tremendously exciting. And so we've it's, it became almost neuro-reductionistic. So down, everything became about the brain, brain, brain. So it's almost like we swapped from in the 80s saying that there is a mind and a brain and they're separate and they work together and the one drives the other to saying, oh, well, the mind, we can't put our finger on it. So therefore, let's focus on the brain and the brain does everything. And the word mind and brain became subsumed into one concept. So generally, most people um, that, that now that are listening, um, this day and age kind of thing, the zeitgeist, this time frame, will think that mind and brain are the same thing and will use the words interchangeably. Meanwhile, they're so totally different and both need each other, but they are different. And we also, most people will feel that the uh, will, will not feel most people would have without even being aware of it because it's in the it's an unconsciously being absorbed that the brain drives everything else and so that's the messaging mind and brain are the same and the brain drives everything and the brain has got all these patterns and <clears throat> programs that are running and and all these things and that is to a certain extent true but it's only true to the extent that the mind actually put the programs there in the first place so the brain can't isn't sentient the brain can't switch itself on, nor can a gene. Those are physical. What's making the brain do stuff and what's making genes do stuff and what's making us breathe and our heartbeat and have this conversation and understand each other and so on is our mind. So the mind is an, is an energy force that we can describe scientifically with things like gravitational fields and electromagnetic light forces and biofields. And well, we've got all the science to explain it. And we've got a lot of evidence explaining it. And it's got a spiritual aspect or a you know non-conscious aspect to it as well. Then there's, we, we also have the science to explain how the brain works and how the body works and we're learning all the time. And we have the science to explain the interaction. Like we can look at an fMRI, we can look at a QEG, we can look at a human in life and see they have an experience, they change. I mean, your story, you went through years of, of um, trauma as a child, you suppressed that and you went into adulthood and you had that knee injury from soccer. I mean, I know your whole story and you landed up being addicted to opioids, you got stuck in alcohol, you had, you know, and you realized that, and what really hit me about your interview, which really, and I know we're getting to the neurocycle, but what really hit me about I mean, I interviewed you and your story was the fact that you said that when after hearing someone say in AA that this is such a struggle and you've been sober, they'd been sober for years and um, that you, know, you can see this really made an impression on me. And you decided at that point, you didn't want to keep struggling. You wanted to choose to do the work, to change and find why am I showing up like this? Why have I got stuck in this pattern of addiction, this pattern of behaviors? And you did 
long, hard work to go and find the source and to reconstruct that. Realizing you can't change what happened in your past. Realizing you couldn't change the choices you made that led to the addiction, which was a coping a set of coping behaviors that got entangled in your network and then sort of driving you and creating this negative feedback loop. But you realize that there's something in you your mind, entire Gibson's mind was this recognition, this wisdom that said, okay, well, that is not the reality I want. I can, there's this reality that that's happening, but there's something more. And I mean, I'm paraphrasing, it's not your exact words, but the concept and you dug deep and you realize, and that was your mind. You couldn't have done that if you were just a brain. Your brain didn't do that time. You did that with your mind and with your mind, you made a choice. And the day you made that choice was the day that you changed. And I've interviewed so many people and I've been in practice, for, was in practice for 25 years and have been in this field for so long. And I have heard thousands and thousands of people have their own unique stories, but say that they had to make that choice. That's something they got to the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the bottom and realized and they shifted. There's something just changed. And then the work began. And this is what the neurocycle basically is. It's looking at how did your life experiences become part of your network? Your story because your listeners are familiar with your story how did that and and the network what is that how did it get into your mind what does that look like how did it get into your brain how did it get into your body does it get somewhere first what does that whole thing look like and how did that get to driving you to where you were and how did you change that network so it no longer drove you a new network drove um drove you and that's what the neurocycle does it looks at how it gets in how it shows up and how we can reverse engineer that process. And it also looks at the good stuff that you're doing in your life, all the great practices that you do and what you do in the morning and the evening and your knowledge of attachment theory and all that kind of thing, that you build those networks in and you use those networks to help you. So you've used the neurocycles. Also, you, we do it, we, we, every human does the neurocycle. They just may not know the name and they may not use it consciously, but it's how information gets in, how we build habits. So you built with all the knowledge you gain from your, your studies and your experiences, you wired in networks and those networks you used, it's all mind driven to then help you overcome and, and create new networks. But you still remember how you were because you could tell me your story. You haven't forgotten that. It's never going to leave you. You just changed what it looked like inside your mind, brain, and body by tapping into your wisdom. And so then, and, and then you accelerate that, you, you build on that every day, you keep on with your practices, growing it more. That's also the neurocycle. So the neurocycle also helps to take what we know is good, what is a good experience, like your weekend with your family. You just had a beautiful Easter weekend with your family and you are focusing on those thoughts, those you grow the neurocycle. That's an experience that's come in. You, you're not going to just use the neurocycle to find the problems and fix them, which is a huge one use. The other use is to take the good stuff and grow it, like your knowledge of attachment theory, like your knowledge of those practices, like these beautiful moments with your family. So it is a way of taking advantage of, in a good sense, not a negative sense. It's a way of taking advantage of how information gets in and how it drives us and how to recognize the negative patterns and reverse engineer and how to recognize the good patterns and make them bigger and therefore tap into the unlimited resilience that we have. I so that's like the, that's the foundation. <laughs> I love that. That's a beautiful explanation. And I really love and appreciate the distinction between the mind and the brain and how there's that, that mind part of ourselves that has the ability to interact in a different way than the brain ever could. Right. And, and so I, I think that's really powerful for listeners because it's not spoken about nearly enough, especially nowadays. Now in your book, you talk a little bit about the five major steps to the neurocycle. And so can we break those down for listeners, especially so that they can take some of this beautiful information you're sharing and take this out and really start applying it to their own lives and understanding those different entry points in there. So essentially what we do as humans, when we are like, if you're listening to this podcast or watching or doing both, um, you are becoming aware. So initially, as you, as people tuned in and just switched it on, they saw the title or whatever, and that was a general awareness. And then as we're listening now, they're focusing in um, deeply on what we're saying. So there's a focused awareness. So they're gathering awareness of, um, they're gathering the information. I'm giving you the big picture, then I'm going to go into the detail. And then as we're talking, each piece of information that we are giving as we share, as you ask and I answer, um, they are reflecting on. So that's, you know, what does this mean in terms of my experience? So other knowledge around this field and yourself and your life and whatever is is, is being activated from the non-conscious into the conscious mind to help you process this information. It's all happening very fast. It's all happening 
on a non-conscious level at 400 billion actions per second and a conscious level at about 2,000 actions per second. And then there's a stage in between and all that stuff. So it's fast. We only consciously aware of um, the, the really the slowest part, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And the neuro cycle is basically step one is helping you to gather awareness of what you're focusing on and, and helping you to be very focused in on how you're showing up in that moment. So like now this is a positive interaction and it's in good information to help us with our mental health. So, you know, emotions will be anticipation, excitement, to gather awareness of our signals. We gather awareness of how we're showing up. So as you are giving, as we, as, as we gather awareness of the content, um, we have four signals that influence the mindset of how we absorb that content. So if, so those four signals are emotions, behaviors, bodily sensations, and perspectives. So if I come into this conversation and I'm listening now, or a listener is coming into the conversation, listening now, and they are saying, oh, wow, this is great. I need help with my mental health. I also want to improve addictive behaviors or whatever. So there's emotion of, you know, there's anticipation excitement um bodily sensation maybe something like you know maybe you raise your shoulders or maybe your heart beats a little faster because your body's responding because memory um memories are stored in the brain and body not top down they are embodied in the brain and the body at the same time basically and then that will lead to certain behaviors maybe they listen deeper maybe they lean in maybe they they shift the how they're focusing in that moment. And then perspective is the attitude, the mindset. Oh, I'm going to learn from this. There could be an opposite reaction. I could, um, someone could some, come and say, look, I, addiction's a disease. I have no control. So their attitude is one of maybe negativity, you know, so they're negative. That's, this is, this is not true or nonsense, or whatever. Their um, bod bodily sensations would be maybe like a bit of anger, tension in the body. Their, uh, uh, their behaviors could be, oh, this is ridiculous. And maybe they're moving and getting angry or whatever. I'm I'm just making this, I'm, I'm just giving examples. And perspective is, this is ridiculous information, but you're not going to listen to challenge. They're going to get two different, they're gathering the awareness in, of the strategy ways, yeah. different ways. We, when we as humans function, we gather awareness. We go from general and then we focus. And then once we, as we gather, we then reflect, which is, you know, why? What does this mean for me? Where is this coming from? And that then leads to a mind storm type activity where um, whether you consciously write something down or consciously use this process or if it's just happening as it does all the time non-consciously, um, you we when we've gathered awareness of those signals and we've started reflecting, that generates that that process activates lots of memories within thoughts to be activated. And so we start thinking as as I'm talking now, everyone's not just hearing what I'm saying, but they're thinking of all different kinds of things. That's a mind storm, which is the third step. So it creates this interaction of pulling up existing memories. And then what we start doing is we start saying, okay, well, this is what it's activating. How am I going to handle this? Well, how can I apply this in my life to that addiction? This is great information. Or the other side of the coin, the other example I gave us, oh, you know, right, this is nonsense or whatever. Or maybe I can learn whatever. So the fourth step is a kind of rechecking where you are reconceptualizing. You're taking, you're trying to make sense, patterns, triggers, that sort of thing. What does this mean? What can I use this information for? And then that leads to the fifth step, which is an action and an action act of reach, which is I'm going to listen to the rest of the podcast and then I'm going to re-listen and maybe get the book or the app because I have an app for the NeuroCycle. Or it could be, this is absolute nonsense. I'm switching it off right now. That's also an action. So um, that's just too broad. So we're doing this all day long at 400 billion actions per second. And that think of it like a comic book. When someone creates a comic book, they make to, to get one little frame of a second. I think they create something like 40 images. Um, so that's kind of what's happening. We see the one, the movement of Mickey Mouse doing whatever, but behind that is like 40 different images. And behind that, there's more. That's what's happening. So this is happening in these, we experience it as a flow of consciousness, but there's a lot of frames behind the process. So what I've done with the neurocycle is look at the frames, bring them into the conscious mind. And I've shown that when we, we're still doing the neurocycle all the time, those frames are happening. But when you consciously and deliberately add it as a technique in your life and build it as a skill and use it for dealing with traumas that have become habits or bad habits that have just got more entrenched or in the moment with situations that you know help uh, that you need help in, or whatever, or helping you to focus and concentrate and get the most out of something like a podcast or a lecture or something, if you deliberately and consciously use it, what it does is it redirects the energy 
um, which is nothing weird. It's basic stuff that runs your cell phone, runs your computer, runs lights. Energy is not, that's the same energy that is going into our brain, just in different formats. It helps you to direct that energy. So mind is always changing brain. Brain is always changing. Mind is always changing body. Body is always changing. The mind is embrained and embodied and it's always changing. So if you don't change the direction, so if you get into a frustration, you have an argument with someone, you get worked up, you don't process it or whatever. So those five steps are happening and they're happening in a chaotic way and they are creating chaos in the brain and the body. And this is why if we don't resolve relationships issues, if we don't resolve traumas from the past, we will eventually explode. And that exploded in your life, which was triggered by the opioid addiction when you had the knee injury. You know, and then that, that's a big one in your life, but we all have little ones too. We all have some big ones and we all have little ones all the time that we're working on. So that so that's the neurocycle is doing that. So the five steps are together, awareness, reflect, mind storm and write that down if possible. We, you know, when you're conscious, you write it down. When you're consciously aware, I should say, when you, as it's happening all the time, it's more of a visual thing that happens inside the mind-brain-body connection. It happens really fast. Then the fourth step is to recheck and the fifth step is an active reach. And you can use it to build and you can use it to reverse engineer. Okay, so I love this. You can use it over in the moment. And I love what you say that this is happening all the time with or without our awareness, right? This is something that's taking place all the time. And what you've done is being able to do the research to hack it, to understand what's actually taking that's place. It's a mind. Conscious level of mind so that we can actually reverse engineer those steps. So you you do discuss in your book more a little bit about um, depression and anxiety. And I think that these are things that in our world and in our, in our society, in a similar way to addiction, you know, I don't want to take away from people's experience of how difficult these things are. But a lot of the times we're looking at treatment plans for individuals that are to take SSRIs and, you know, do these different things rather than to really understand what's taking place at this root level to begin with and how we can sort of hack and rewire that system. So I would love if you could take the listeners through whether you'd like to go down the rabbit hole of depression or anxiety, some of those examples of how that neurocycle may be happening for an anxious or depressed person and how we can actually reverse engineer those steps to, to, to start seeing transformation in people's lives. Yes, we have in our current languaging, we have things like anxiety, depression, which everyone knows about, and but we have them and an understanding of them that they are mental illnesses. And this is so unfortunate because depression is not a mental illness, nor is anxiety. Now I'm going to say something I'm going to say something just to clarify that. I am like you, Ty, not trying to take away from the person's experience. In fact, the way I'm about to explain it actually makes it puts more focus on the person's experience than just a label or a diagnosis, which actually reduces the person's story to a label and actually dishonors the person. And it doesn't even really take into account how difficult something like feeling depression and anxiety or dealing with addictive behaviors and that kind of thing, how hard it is. So current labeling and diagnosing is actually not honoring of a person's story and kind of underplays it. And which sounds almost like a contradiction. So when we when people get a label of depression or anxiety, it's initially like a gift because it feels, oh wow, that explains everything. And that's why it's like a gift. But it's a gift that when you act, it's beautifully wrapped, but when you open it, there's nothing inside. And that nothing inside is now what? Now I've got this label and a label and a diagnosis at, 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 in, the, in the scientific philosophy of men, of illness and diagnosis means that there's a source. And in mental illnesses, they say the source is a broken brain, broken genes, broken chemicals, broken. And then it's, oh my gosh, not only am I battling with depression, but I'm actually a broken person. And what we've seen from the research is that that first of all, that philosophy of seeing depression as a chemical imbalance or as genes that are that you can't control or has as having a, a brain that's just deformed in some or broken in some way, takes away hope, produces healing and and removes the natural cycles that we go through in life of when we have adverse experiences, we will have depression. It's a normal response. We need to go through that. And it, it's got a time, a sort of natural time and 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 we've taken all that naturalness out of our context of our lives and our stories of our lives, and we've tried to stick them into a medical label. And that medical labeling works beautifully for anything, like whether it's, a, let's say it's a neurological problem, like a TBI, or whether it's a there's a tumor, whether there's cancer, whether there's in, uh, diabetes. That medical, biomedical model works beautifully for that because we can do a test, we can track an underlying neuro, uh, neurological or biological 
course, like maybe there's a problem with your something with your heart, with your blood pressure, your blood flow, uh, whatever. There's so many different things and there's a lot of tests as we know we can do to identify. The word diagnosis implies there's an underlying biological cause. So when someone says they have a diagnosis of depression, they are automatically thinking there's an underlying bio, uh, biological cause in the brain. And that's why I'm feeling depressed. And that's wrong. It's disproved. It never was accurate, but that's not what the general public are told. The 95% of the general public believe that if they're depressed, they have a chemical imbalance. Now, that's been disproved over and over and over by top neuroscientists around the world. And it's also been shown by top researchers around the world, including the work I've done with my team, that with that thinking that you have a disease, it keeps you stuck, reduces hope, and slows down healing. So we want... so I, So... The word depression, don't see it as a label or a diagnosis. See it as, and then it turns it into a real gift, see it as a description. Yes. And if you see it as a description, okay, I'm feeling depressed at this moment. Then we can say, okay, well, what is depression? It's an emotion. So it's one of those four signals. This is not who you are. It is how you're showing up in the moment because of something. So we need to find that something because... Every experience we have as humans goes in via the mind, as I've explained, into the network of the mind-brain-body network. It physically grows into the brain in a tree-like structure. I've actually got a little tree here that we can people can visualize. So this conversation looking growing into this tree-like structure with roots and so on in into the brain. In the body, it's growing at the same time into every cell of the body. It's growing into a hedge shape. So in the brain, it's like a tree. In the body, it's like these little tight-packed hedges. If it's a healthy experience like this conversation it will be a healthy looking tree and healthy looking hedge and if it's not it will be a toxic looking one so it's bent and ugly and bigger and smaller and all weird and whatever in the mind because memory this conversation is building in three places every experience goes in three places brain is a tree body is hedges and then into the mind it, it's like a field so mm -hmm. if you think of waves or you think of like if you look at a podcast you can see the little you know, recording going up and down, just to give you a visual analogy. So there's a pattern in the field that's going through you, all over you. And we've got all our memories are these fields that are moving. You can, and there's great visuals on, on, you can just go Google fields or whatever, and you'll find that's a, to give you a visual analogy. So it's in three places and those are connected. The fields connected to the tree, connected to the hedges. And for every single experience, we have this. And there's obviously lots of data in each of those networks. So this conversation by now, we've actually said close to 2000 words at this point. And that's your brain will select out about 15 to 35%. So you've already got about 800 words in your you know, 800 branches growing in the roots and the, and, and the tree part wow. and 800 bits of data in the hedges. And as we talk more, will be added and 800 vibrations in the waves. I mean, it's a lot to process, but I'm, I'm, I want to make it as real for people as possible because this is very, very real. And if I'm constantly bombarding my brain and body with a bunch of negative ones so think of a tsunami does a damage a toxic experience is like a tsunami think of a happy experience like your easter weekend that's not a tsunami it's a beautiful flow the one is going to create a really good um blood flow oxygen flow um all the energy that we need for the heart to be that's all going to be very healthy it'll influence how the electromagnetic action of the heart functions all that stuff the negative one is going to do the opposite it's going to create a lot of problems throughout the whole vulnerability and so on and then over time if we don't deal with that stuff it eventually creates a vulnerability to disease it's not overnight it's not i get depressed now and i'm dead tomorrow there's cycles to these things and there's time cycles to these things so therefore depression then is an emotional warning signal and very seldom do we just have one if you actually ask yourself i feel depressed you could probably label five or six or seven or eight or 10 other, emo other emotions that are going hand in hand with the depression. And if you really think about it, you could actually ask yourself, where am I feeling that depression in my body? You know, and and we know that, I mean, there's Candace Pert's work in the 80s was way before Bessie van der Kolk's work. She's one of my, my heroes and mentors. She's dead now, but she did the work Candace Pert on molecules of emotion at the same time as Dr. Marion Diamond, who did radical work on how thoughts grow in our brain and whatever. So they've been massive inspirations for my work. But they they um, showed back in the 80s already how um, we, whatever we experience is not just a brain event. It is a mind-brain-body event, and there's a change that's happening. 
and my work in neuroplasticity showed that that change is happening. You can direct that change with, with the, the neurocycle. So the emotion of depression can show up in your body. We could it show up? Maybe it could show up with gut problems. Very, very often depression is linked to a problem with probiotics in, you know, the gut bacteria and IBS and the bloating and, you know, all those kinds of things because of the, it, there's a, the, although the mind brain body is linked everywhere it's 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 all synonymous there's a very direct pathway uh, between the mind and the brain and it's just very obvious like your you know your you you feel your gut very quickly and that kind of thing so there's so you could be having gut issues so that's the body and it could be that as you have that depressed experience you just feel that surge of bloating or the gut ache or something like that and then behavior wise it you know maybe you've been very withdrawn lately or maybe you're sleeping more or Maybe you can't get out of bed or whatever. And then in terms of perspective, life sucks. So there's, you know, four signals. So now I've gathered awareness. So that's food. step one. And I just want to, I just want, because you're saying so many amazing things. I just want to reiterate this for our listeners. So this is step one of the neuro cycle. And you talked about the four pieces of feedback that were, and can you repeat them again? There are your emotions, your body sensations, your yes. behaviors, and your perspective. So you those are four Thank, that's, thank you for summarizing. They are four signals. They always work together. We hear so much talk in the current um, sort of social media world and psycho psychological world of, of emotions, 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 emotions. Emotions never live alone. Emotions never operate alone. That You will always feel an emotion in your body and it will affect your behavior and it will affect your perspective. So they always work together. So it's never a good idea to just say, I feel. It's always a good idea to say, I feel, and I feel it in my body, and it's affecting my behavior, and it's also sh shifting my perspective. And then you need to automatically then move to step two, because that's just gathered. Gather awareness is gathering awareness of those four four signals. And then you step two, which is, okay, I'm, I'm, I need to reflect. Why? Why? And reflection is like a white light through a prism. If you shine a white light through a prism, it comes out like a rainbow. So there's this laser focus of the gather awareness. Now in the reflect step, you start breaking that down. Why? Why am I feeling this? You know, where's this potentially coming from? So you, you may not get all the solutions yet at that, but you're starting to get the reflection to see what it is. Then that stimulates all those memories. So now you may start seeing in your reflect step that, okay, this pattern of depression and withdrawing and gut ache and life sucks. This is happening at least three or four times a day, but specifically in the morning when I wake up or when something happens during the course of the day that seems to throw me off. So there seems to be something, but I'm not sure what. And then, oh my goodness, now all these memories are being stimulated. So then that takes you to step three, mind storm happens. So as I gather and reflect, so then you write whatever comes to your mind, you just put that on a piece of paper. And the best way is in what I call a metacog. There's videos on my app. This is what my app looks like. On the phone, there's the whole program, whatever you can do later if you want to about that. Really tell people what, to, what the app is, because this app will help them guide themselves through the process. Yeah. Right? So what is the app called? Is it called the NeuroCycle? It's called the NeuroCycle, and I can show you what it looks like on the on the, what, on the on the actual page. So I'm going to hold that up there. Oopsie. It's that yeah. one over there. I put my finger on it. It's yeah. available on iTunes and Google Play. There's also a web version. Um, and if, if in it, we've got the, so what I'm telling you to do now, like walking you through finding the four, the, the four signals and yeah. reflect it all in the app. And so that the big green block in the middle is me walking you through this process. And then um, you, you, you'll you see it's over 63 days, but we can get to that in a moment. I don't want to bombard people with too much. There's also a decompression guide. So let's say that, I mean, this is something you're very familiar with also, Ty, in terms of when someone's really worked up, you can't go into any kind of attachment work or anything. You've got to actually calm down first. So the depression guides are for that. There's many neurocycles. Like let's say you end up work and someone's really toxic and you get thrown off. You quickly sneak off, put your earphones on, and there's a quick neurocycle, how to deal with toxic people, for example. Okay. If you're... <laughs> If you're I love a, fantastic and if you're a parent there's also a guide for parents which matches the book that i've written how to help your child clean up their mental mess um and that's for parents teachers whatever to help children from as young as two because my youngest patients were two and three years of age and i taught them the system um helping them with that so this is a guide for parents that goes with that book to help them help themselves yeah I so that helps parents and then there's all kinds of other things so essentially what i'm telling you to do i'll walk you through that now very quickly i just want to mention yeah, we'll finish like the last steps there as well i want to go back through the steps as well you left on the, uh, step three for the, the depression neurocycle so the depression neurocycle so um then uh, um uh, uh, 
I just want to quickly say something that I don't forget as we, we're going to come to step three, that you can use any technique that you want. So in other words, your work on attachment theory is going to be fabulous for throughout this process. I'm sure you can already see it because even I reflect, you could say, could it be that my attachment style is a problem here? And then mind storm is going to bring up, oh my goodness, all these things, maybe from childhood, maybe from a marriage, maybe from a work, maybe from a friend, whatever. Uh, something relationship or something and it's all popping up so the mind storm activates that um, flow of memories that are built into thought because a thought is the experience and a thought is made of memory so memories are the data of the thought and that's why when we think of one thought it's got so much stuff in it it's got a root which is the origin story and it's got the branches which are your interpretation of the origin story so for example in your case the stuff that happened in childhood would be in the roots and then the processing we process we process to cope. So it's not always the best processing we do in, in traumatic situations. And then that would have produced these branches which generated your behavior. And that was one of initially suppression and then activated and triggered by the knee injury. And, that's, and then when you started doing the work, you started finding the thought and you got down to the root, you saw the root and you recognized in the root that there is you had a certain type of attachment theory and it came from so you're going and that's what the neurocycle is doing so your your third step is generating this data to start finding more details and then yeah. it's messy and, yes. and the metacog, and you mentioned the metacog so you can write on a piece of paper but if you write on a piece of paper I'm, I'm doing this get a blank piece of paper or go on your phone or whatever try not write linear just try and write all over the place as a thought comes the more you are the, that's more that the more you're all over the place, the more less nonlinear, the, le the more nonlinear you are, the more effectively you'll dive into the depths of your wisdom and your non-conscious mind. The Metacog is a system I developed over, over 40 years ago, and it's been developed over the years. Looks similar to a mind map, looks similar to a concept map, that branch thing, but it's not a concept. So a mind map and a concept map take around about 5 to 15% of information. It's too little. Okay, you need more than that. So you'll miss details. You'll get a great way of getting the big picture. But if you want to dive deep, you have to get to the you have to get to at least fifteen to thirty five percent. My Metacog's concept maps are around about two to five, maybe ten percent. If you're lucky, fifteen, but not generally. A Metacog takes you from the fifteen to the thirty five, forty percent. You don't want more than that because then it's redundancy. So if you the the extra padding. Of, of that is going to block out your concept, um, your ability to really dive deep. So the that's why the app and the book and all that kind of thing walk you through this. Take back to you. Yeah. yeah. Helps you because it's a lot to process. And would you say there's any, for anybody listening, in particular prompts that would be really beneficial, like just types of questions they could ask themselves as they're hitting step three of the, the mind storm? Um, are there any specific prompts that can be really useful for listeners? Absolutely. So the, your prompts are going to very much, uh, very strongly come from your four signals. And what you've reflected on. So if you think of it, you're going to say, I feel depressed. I, uh, I feel depressed. I've got gut ache. I'm um, withdrawing and life sucks. And why am I doing this? This is coming from something that's been, it's a, you know, this has been going on for a while. I, I wonder if it isn't something to do with maybe my childhood or, you know, there's something going on here. Oh gosh, childhood memory, this memory, this, I'm on step three now, childhood memory. Uh, work memory, sibling relationship. This happened yesterday. Or even if it seems unrelated, you just dump it down. And if you do a metacog, a metacog is um, also dumped down, but it's 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 structured in in a way that you start in the middle with a circle and you work for, uh, from the top right and you work around the circle. You can if you left handed. If you want to go the other way around, clockwise, you anti clockwise, you can. And the and everything's on a line, in a bubble attached like think of a tree nothing floats yeah. so the fact of drawing a line writing the word or the phrase on the line deciding is this next word or this next set of words is this another concept so i need to start a new line coming from the central bubble or is this still related to this i'm not sure where to put it i think i'll put it there i'm not sure where to put it i'll just put it anywhere for now and then i'll attach it later that's the process it's very it's very generative Yes. And I love that because you're really getting all the information sort of flowing from that space of consciousness. And, and do you find that it's useful to look at when this started? Like, to me, that just seems like such an important prompt. When did I start feeling depressed? Like what was taking place at that time? Are there any things like that, that are really extra meaningful in the process or is it more to be free flowing? Four steps. So this is the thing we're so used to trying to do too much at once. It's really important that you follow um, the sequence correctly. Otherwise, we do too much and then we skip steps. And we skip. And when you skip steps, you don't change the network properly because we're driving energy to pull apart a toxic 
literally weaken the branches, pull them apart and build a new one. And that requires a very distinct process. The mind brain body network requires a very clear process. So the, after the mind storm, then you get to the recheck and that's where you're going to say, okay, this has happened. What can I do? Now you're going to ask a little bit more depth qu type questions of the how, the what, the when, the where, the why, the who. So how often am I doing it? Where am I doing it? Who am I doing this with? You know, so you'll reflect, started the process of why am I doing this? I think it's got something to do with this. Oh, generated ideas. Step three, step four is okay. Now I've got this mess in front of me. What does this mean? This has happened. What does this mean? What's the pattern? What's the trigger? What are the connections? What are the associated memories? Those, so there's some basic um, basic questions that you use to guide yourself in that recheck step. That takes the longest because it is, you know, where you really- Investigated at that point in a sense. Okay, you gather data up to this point. Now you're investigating. You're trying to make sense. But when in doing the work, you have to close the cycle with step five. And step five is an act of reach because our brain and our conscious mind get very, very tired. This is very draining. Think of having a lot of apps open on your phone and you're talking as well and you're FaceTiming and you're Zooming and suddenly your phone's dead and it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. That's what happens if you overdo it. You're going to have so many things opening. It's incredibly draining. Your brain gets tired and needs recharging. Your conscious mind gets tired and needs recharging. But your non-conscious, which is not your unconscious, your unconscious is when you're asleep. We don't store anything in the unconscious. It's a state of mind. We store in the non in the non-conscious N O N. And the subconscious is a is a like a waiting room, a doorway or portal between the conscious and the non-conscious. So the but the non-conscious never gets tired. The subconscious is a waiting room, so it kind of just hangs out there. The conscious mind gets tired. So therefore, this is very limited. So when you do it time-wise, when you do a neurocycle, I always recommend in the first 21 days, and we'll talk about the timing as well, the first 21 days, you spend 15 to 30 minutes max, 40 minutes at an absolute push. Otherwise, you're going to exhaust yourself and you're going to try and solve it all in one day and you're going to get really frustrated. It's a little bit at a time. Habits are built a tiny bit at a time. It's micro exercises daily micro neurocycles to build into the into the big work now i say 21 because that's where you sorry if I, um, if you deconstruct you take the signals you find the thought and you deconstruct down to the root and you reconstruct then you've got to stabilize that and that's the second 42 days so if at the end of let me see if i've got a small tree here at the end of 21 days you would have cleaned up the root and you would have built, um, you would have, let's say it's a big ugly tree. You can't pull the tree out. That doesn't work in this network. It doesn't work like that. You've got to go to the root, which is what these five steps daily are doing over time. You can use attachment theory, you can use CBT techniques, but they work. CBT techniques, for example, work at step five. Brilliant. For step five, a little bit of step four, because you can see you may be generalizing or something like that. Um, affirmations work at step five. So I'm not saying throw any of those out. A, a dialogue, a dialectical behavior type therapy, if you've done any of that, step four, recheck. So all of the existing paradigms of therapy or things that, that you can use to help you techniques, you fit them into, but most of them will fit into step four and step five. Yes. And then for stage 42 to 63, you're stabilizing, you're turning it into a habit. Habits form over 63 days, not 21. So you've done a lot of work in the first 21 days. That's why you spend 15 to 30 minutes. The second 42 days, around about five to 10 minutes. Same five steps, yeah. but just. Can we backtrack for one moment? So the first 21 days, when you have those five steps, are you starting like step one for a few days, step two for a few days, or are you kind of outlining step five, all the five steps and, and then you're kind of adding steps. to them and increasing your work and in depth into diving in there across the 21 day cycle? It's cumulative. So thank you for asking that. So it's cumulative. You do step one for, let's say, two minutes, step two for, let's say, two minutes, step three for, let's say, two minutes, step four for maybe three minutes or four minutes. And then step four is this kind of summary work and whatever. Out of that, you build it. So therefore, today, this is what I've learned. What can I do today to help me through today? And that's what the active reach is. So an active reach could be something as simple as give yourself a high five every time. You, and that's all you do. Then tomorrow you pick up, start it, and you work through all five steps again. And you, you, know, you learn some more. So you change your active reach. The whole point of step five is to start moving you forward in the direction of progress and stabilizing you and that kind of thing so there's um so that, yeah that's basically how how the process works 
Now, can you give us some extra examples from after day 21 until day 63, other examples of habits that people could um, start taking part in in order to really shift out of these experiences? The habit formation phase happens over all 63 days, Ty. So it's a full 63-day cycle. The, it's two phases. Phase one is find the thought, deconstruct it, rebuild it. That's why that takes 15 to 30 minutes a day. At day 21, I've now got a new healthy thought, but it's small. It's, let's say, the size of that branch. Now, yeah. it's competing with all the other experiences that you've had, which are memories inside thoughts. So there's a forest of trillions of experiences. And whatever you've practiced the most, whatever you think about the most grows, whatever you're doing the most in your life, that's the biggest tree. So now I've got this new tree, but it's the size. It's competing in a forest of trees. So it's you're going to know you've done the work. You're going to know where you want to go. You know what to do. You're on the road to healing. But you'll find if you don't stabilize from day sort of 23 onwards, it drops dramatically. And so there's a healing journey. And there's 10 sort of stages on the healing journey. And this is what I've done in my in my research as well. We just published a paper on this actual healing journey just recently and how it affects, it changes the brain and all that stuff. Um, and so the phase two is where you take that little tree and you grow it. It's literally growing the tree. So you're still doing the neurocycle, but you're adding active energy. Like you add water to a plant and it grows every day. So you do the same five steps, but you're not digging around for problems. You're actually looking at how can I make this stronger? Like how can I be... Um, be praise myself more, celebrate myself more, and um, be kinder to myself and to others. We we grow our tree into a big habit that is useful by a building process. So the second phase is doing a lot of um, it's the five steps, but it's more of a building process um, of you know, praise and that kind of stuff and um, understanding and recognizing. For example, they I think it's around day 20, 28 or thirty two. I'm trying to think exactly because there's so many different things where we start noticing other people's reactions to our healing. Mm. And that can throw us off because we, we know we're healing. We know we're on our journey. But people are so used to us being a certain way. And they can be quite negative and think, well, you know, is this a flash in the pan? And that negativity can really throw you off. Yeah. So um, it can be, um, it's really important to recognize at that day, um, around that period, two or three days in that time frame, what others say to you can throw you off and can, take a bit of energy away and make the tree get a little small instead of a little bigger so by having that awareness you can then say oh when people say those things to you well they're not reacting like you would like them to react to you this is okay this is normal you tell yourself that so instead of the tree shrinking it gets bigger right. so it's, yeah so there's a lot of distinct phases you go through in the whole process and the people are not doing in therapy they're not doing this in their day-to-day -day life because people aren't telling them Where? about it Exactly. That's why you, yeah, that's why therapy can run for years and years and years when it shouldn't. It should be phased. It should be in phases. And I also think you have some of the most deep and profound work on this. You know, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of people out there studying this as deeply and as in detail as you are. And so I think that's part of why it's not really getting out to the masses in the same way. And I have one last question about this that I think is, and I would love if maybe after this, you can take us through a quick rundown of the app in, in more detail, um, yes. just briefly. But I have one question. Could you give an example for people? Because I, I think this is really profound. And, you know, you've mentioned earlier in the podcast, nerve cycles are happening all the time to us, whether we like them or not, ready? And, and, and right? And so I would love if you could give an example, whether it's social media or television or something culturally or happening in society that may actually be affecting us in a negative way because of how these patterns are being formed that we may not even be realizing. Just so people also understand that, you know, in a sense, if you're not doing this work, the work's kind of being done to you from other external factors that you may not really want to be taking hold of all of your patterning. So do you have an example of that, that that can sort of be really clear to people? We are absorbing up to 95% of our environment into our non-conscious mind. So in order to survive as a human, our non-conscious network, which is our most intelligent part of us, which drives our messy mind, our wise mind, it drives the brain and the body, um, it's our driving force. It's set up to protect and to survive. And um, it's connected to the wisdom of, you know, the ages and the universe and whatever how, whatever philosophy you believe in, whether it's God or whether it's, you know, it's all kind of the same thing with just different words. Um, and we we as humans collectively draw on each other's, we, we, it's not about us, it's about us in the world. So we are, we, we in order to survive, we have to absorb our environments. And so we do. We absorb up to 95% of our environments non-consciously. 
bypasses your conscious. And then what that does is it then comes up in packages, um, small packages, because our conscious mind can only handle seven to 10 things in, in a moment. 2,000 actions per second is kind of this. <laughs> so, you know, that's, so things go, things that are, definitely negatively impactful on you as a person your non-conscious gathers gathers those and puts them in the waiting room of your subconscious and then as it's appropriate because you you're brilliant and your brilliance is organizing all of this and it sits there in, the, in this, this waiting room of the subconscious and and as we are in the situation where we need to use that or respond or change something it then moves into the conscious mind as the signals so if we find ourselves suddenly thinking about things that are why am I thinking about that why am I doing this or why am I ruminating on that or why am I starting to look at life in this way or why am I suddenly responding like that to a person why am I so reactive when we start being more self-regulated and observing ourselves which is mind management which is what's going to happen when you're neurocycle it's what's going to happen when we apply the attachment theory principles to find out why we have the roots as they are. Um, when we do that, then we start to basically um, recognize, allow the things coming from the waiting room into the conscious mind, it draws them up. And then we can recognize the signals and say, oh gosh, that isn't who I am. I don't think like that. I'm not X, Y, or Z, or I don't have subscribed to that kind of philosophy, or I'm not biased like that, or I would never do such a thing. Okay, so then that's come from something you've observed. And it's an awareness. You need to know that because that's a sort of philosophical part of our zeitgeist currently, but it's going to affect you in a negative way because if you take, adopt that, maybe it's an attitude of, you know, um, frustration. Frustration or something as much as um, we have a very coddled mind. We, we told resilience, this is a good one. We told, because I know you like resilience. Resilience, we told it's, it's that it's limited and that people have compassion fatigue. Now, there's a lot of research on compassion fatigue. I've done a whole teaching on it as well. Um, and compassion fatigue is a reality, but it's been explained incorrectly. So we have in our mind the network that I have a limited amount of compassion as a person. And if I keep on giving, 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 I'm going to run out. And if I run out, I'm going to collapse. Totally wrong. Compassion fatigue happens because we don't give our conscious mind and our brain a chance to rest. And we don't give ourselves time, self time to listen to what's in the waiting room and what is getting too much attention that I need to deconstruct and see that I don't want that as part of me. Because if something comes out of the waiting room, I can reorganize that. I can change the tree like I've been describing and I can shift it and get perspective. And sometimes that just takes one year cycle. You can do that in a moment. You can catch it and see this is, you know, it's not, it's not something that you've been doing for a long time. If it's longer, if it's more than 63 days, well, then you're going to have to spend 63 days to, to fix it. So it's to, to recognize those shifts and those changes in oneself um, because that's so not to be um because people often ask gosh I think about these things and it throws me off like someone asked me the other day that she's got this newborn baby and she saw herself throwing a, the baby down the stairs she said she would never do that why did I think that so I said you know you've probably read or watched or seen something of someone who did that and it was so horrific it upset the balance of what we know that you don't do so it's stuck in your mind and now you've you, you, as with this baby's triggered that so that's not who you are so it was in the waiting room came up now you can see, okay, that's not an that's not going to ever happen. Um, your motherhood now activated that terrible thing. It would never happen. So you can don't have to have guilt and blame and think there's something going wrong with you and you're going to hurt your child. It is something that happened in society and you would never do it. It was just triggered because you now have a child. So it's it's to bring it brings perspective and balance to um when, when we self-regulate, when we don't just blindly accept that, gosh, this is, you know, this is who I am because it came out of me. Things are going in. And in the waiting room, and when they come up, judge them, question them. Do I need this? Is this a warning? Is this telling me don't think like this? If I think like this, or is it telling me quite simply you saw something that was triggered by this? That's something you kept and probably shouldn't have kept. Now you can get rid of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely beautifully explained. I, I just love that so much. I love your work. I wish we had four more hours to talk about this. I just love and really, really enjoy this conversation. Um, where can people find more about your app and your books and where can they follow you online? Dr. Caroline Leaf is my social media handle. I'm on all the platforms and you can get everywhere, as we all know from from that from Instagram. 
drleaf.com is my website. We've got a whole store on there. The app is available on iTunes and Google Play. It's called Neurocycle, as I mentioned. Oh, we've even got this new feature we've added now called, it's a, it's a webinar, it's a Neuro Live. So every Monday, I do a live webinar and then it goes into a library and we have all kinds of things in the library, like, you know, how to, compassion for TV, there's a whole thing on that and <clears throat> meals and mental health. And I did one <clears throat> on Monday night on how to reconceptualize. And so there's that feature inside the app too. Um, and so, and then we and I keep adding more and, and that kind of thing. So that you can is you can find on iTunes, Google Play, and there's a web version as well. I think that's pretty much answers everything. And sorry if I've confused everyone. The webinar is inside the NeuroCycle app, so it's a feature inside the app. So when Perfect. you get the app, you can see all the neurolives. So just add more information. A lot of these things we've discussed now, those the sorts of things you'll find in the NeuroLive. I love this. And I just, I want to highly recommend your work to everybody listening. And I just think you're such a pioneer in this whole field and, and doing some of the deepest digging that I've seen around all these different concepts and busting all these sort of myths that we tend to hear in sort of the mainstream world. And just thank you so much for, for coming on here today. And I really appreciate all that you do. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful sharing with you and thank you for your great questions. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Share it with friends and family who are on their journey of personal development and growth. And thank you for listening. Next week, we'll be back with more insights to guide you on your journey. And until then, keep practicing our tools and strategies to change your subconscious mind and apply some of the powerful learnings from this podcast so that you experience real life transformation.